I'm going to be reading from Matthew 27, verses 33 through 50. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I am thirsty, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Those are the the final four, the last uh, recorded statements of Jesus on the cross, just in the moments before he died. And in those words, uh, we're reminded that Um, Jesus was completely God and completely human, that he willingly suffered and died for us, that he completed a plan that had been decided ages before, and that he repaired this this fatal rupture between us and God caused by our sin. That's Good Friday, right? That's why we're here. And a lot of Fridays, uh, you know, I'll say to Emily and she'll say back to me, Happy Friday, right? That's, you know, a common thing. We get to the end of the work week, looking forward to the weekend, Um, and obviously Good Friday feels a little bit different. I definitely think we can say happy Good Friday today looking back on that day, but, you know, almost 2,000 years ago on that day, um, I think it it felt anything but happy, uh, but it was definitely good. Uh, Some would say we don't celebrate Good Friday, right? We observe uh, Good Friday, um, and it's, it's a solemn night, right? A night where we remember what Jesus did for us at the cross. Many of you know the story, of course, right? Good Friday is the day that Jesus um, was falsely accused, that he was unjustly sentenced to die. It was the day he was rejected by all kinds of people uh, from crowds that chose Barabbas to be released, the criminal to be released instead of Jesus, um, to even some of his own followers as, as his close disciple Peter denies him three times. Good Friday is the day that Jesus was brutally flogged and beaten uh, by the Roman soldiers, the day that he was, um, of course, we said unjustly sentenced to die by the Roman and Jewish authorities, the day he had to carry his own cross with the help of Simon, um, and just the day he was mocked by all around him, even including condemned criminals around him. And of course, Good Friday is the day that Jesus was disgracefully lifted up on the cross uh, and, and died a death that was, you know, one of the worst forms of execution in human history, crucifixion. All right, Good Friday is the day that Jesus died for us in our place. 
Um, and so that's why we're, we're here today. Now, as we look at the Gospels, we heard from Matthew 27 there, none of the Gospels gives us um, a full account of every detail and of every time that things happen, but as we look through the four Gospels, we can kind of piece together a a pretty simple timeline for what happened. Um, We see, of course, uh, late Thursday night, early into Friday morning um, is when Jesus is kind of passed back and forth between some of the different authorities, between Pontius Pilate and Caiaphas and Herod. Um, And as he heads into the the early morning is when he begins to suffer some of his beatings. And it's sometime uh, after 6 a.m. that he's finally sentenced to die by crucifixion. And that's when he carries the cross to Golgotha. Uh, That's when he gets help from Simon of Cyrene to get the cross there. And he was probably crucified around 9 a.m. And then we have about three hours on the cross. And then somewhere uh, after those three hours is when um, that darkness settles over the land And then about three hours later, uh, would have been about six agonizing hours on the cross, Jesus finally dies probably about 3 p.m. And we get a lot of our knowledge of what happened at the crucifixion um, and and how crucifixion was done from other ancient sources. Um, We get it from some of our Old Testament prophecies where we see it uh, clearly spoken you know, spoken of as we look back at it. Um, We might even get some of our knowledge of of crucifixion from movies we've seen, Mel Gibson's The Passion or other movies that you might see. But it is kind of interesting that when you're looking at the Gospels, all four of them are uh, just like, you know, what Val read for us up there. Um, They only give it in one sentence. In Matthew 27, it said, when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes. That was it. That was all it says. That isn't the focus of the the gospel writers, uh, the details of what happened as he was nailed to the cross. Um, But there's a large focus on the words of Jesus, on the words and actions of the people that are around him, uh, the the supernatural occurrences of the day. And so that's what we're going to focus on tonight, um, is some of those final words of Jesus on the cross. Uh, Between the four Gospels, we get seven statements of Jesus on the cross, or sometimes called the seven last words of of Jesus traditionally. And three of those probably occurred kind of in those first three hours. But then that's when the the supernatural darkness occurs. We heard it in Matthew 27. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. And we don't know exactly what happened in those three hours of darkness. The gospel writers don't really give us uh, what was said. They don't give words of Jesus. They don't even really give the actions of the people around him. But obviously that, that three-hour darkness just magnifies that the sin of the entire world, of every generation from the beginning of time until the end of time, is being laid on Jesus. And that the wrath of God and that the penalty for sin um, that should rightfully fall on us instead is falling on Jesus. That's what's happening during those three hours of darkness. And it's somewhere near the end of those three hours that we get those last four statements of Jesus on the cross. And they probably came just within minutes of each other right before he died. And those four final statements, interestingly enough, they're all right out of the Psalms, and they're out of specifically out of Psalms written by David when he was in times of persecution. And two of the four are direct quotes from Psalms, and then the other two are pretty clear allusions uh, to those as well. And so we're going to look at um, each of those briefly here. We heard in Matthew 27, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's the first line of Psalm 22, which was written by David. Um, Listen to some of the other verses. Psalm 22 is kind of long, and a few of these psalms would be be great this week, tomorrow, this next week. You could read through them uh, to think more about this, but we'll just look at a few verses tonight. So Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has ens- Uh, encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet, and they divide my garments among them, and they cast lots for my clothing. 
Right? Sound familiar? Just so many parallels to what we heard in Matthew's account and what you'd read in some of the other Gospels. The mocking, the insults, the, the head shaking, even the exact words that he was taunted with, the casting lots for his clothing, um, even the pierced hands and feet. And as we wrapped up the Joseph series in the last few weeks, Pastor Mark often said that that story is about Joseph, but it's also about Jesus. And we definitely see that here with these Psalms, that they're very much about uh, David as he's writing about a time of persecution um, and looking forward to uh, hope and expectation on God's deliverance, but also very much a Psalm about the Messiah, uh, Jesus, what he would experience, right? How he would be treated, how he would feel, what he would go through for us at the cross. Next two statements of Jesus are uh, recorded in John just moments before his death. In John 19, it says, Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. I am thirsty is a reference to uh, the thirst of Psalm 69, and we also saw it there in Psalm 22. But Psalm 69 is another psalm of David where David is having all kinds of suffering and persecution uh, because of his commitment to God. Listen to just a few verses from Psalm 69. I'm worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. You know how I am scorned, disgraced, and shamed. All my enemies are before you. They put gall in my food and give me vinegar for my thirst. Right, just more clear parallels, the humiliation, the enemies, the gall, the vinegar, the dry throat. Then he says, it is finished. And that's very similar to the final words of Psalm 22. Uh, verse 31 of Psalm 22 says, They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. It is finished. And the final statement of Jesus, the fourth one, is found in Luke 23 where it says, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. And that's a direct quote from Psalm 31.5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul, my body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction and my bones grow weak. For I hear the slander of many. There's terror on every side. They conspire against me and they plot to take my life. And it's just another Psalm of David where he's expressing faith in the Lord in the midst of persecution and suffering. And um, as I spent time in the four statements of Jesus, in my lifetime, this was probably the most time I had spent thinking about Good Friday as I thought through it the last few months. Uh, And certainly one of the things I felt that I think is part of maybe what we're supposed to feel on this night is unworthiness, (laughs) unworthiness before Jesus because of my sin, Uh, unworthiness to be up here and speaking to you tonight, right? I think these are some of the things that we're supposed to feel. But as I spent time in the four statements of Jesus and spent time in the Psalms that he was drawing from, there were four things I think that really stood out to me. And the first is that Jesus' words from the Psalms are a simple reminder that God planned the cross. It was not a backup plan, right? It was the only plan. And we saw it in those Psalms, three examples, but just three of many in the Old Testament, that looking back now, we can clearly see the connections with Christ. Uh, that those words were just as much about Jesus as they were about David. And the entire Old Testament is filled with stories and psalms and prophecies and allusions and laws and sacrificial systems that, that all point forward to Christ's work on the cross because that was the plan from Genesis until Malachi. But at the time, we know that people didn't really see all of those connections. We saw it right in Matthew 27. Those who were near the cross, some of them didn't really understand what was happening. They didn't even understand what Jesus was saying. They mocked him saying, he's calling Elijah. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. Those uh, Jews near the cross that were there to celebrate his death, they didn't hear Psalm 22. They actually uh, heard Eli, Eloi, sounds like uh, a short form of the name Elijah. And they expected Elijah to come before the Messiah. And so as someone is claiming to be the Messiah and hanging on the cross, they, they mock him, right, for calling out to Elijah. 
Even Jesus' followers that were near the cross probably didn't really understand the significance of what he was saying and what he was doing. Because we see in some other passages, only a week before his death, um, Luke reports that the disciples still didn't get it, right? They're headed to Jerusalem and they didn't grasp what was going to happen. Luke 18 says, Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man must be or will be fulfilled. He'll be handed over to the Gentiles. They'll mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. And it says the disciples did not understand any of this. (laughs) Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about, even after three years of walking with him and listening under his teaching. And we really see that it's after the resurrection, which we'll get to celebrate on Sunday, that the pieces begin to come together. We see Jesus approaching the two unnamed disciples on the road to Emmaus, and it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And then shortly after that, he's with the 11, and he says, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures, right? He's, he's saying these stories you read in Genesis, whether about Abraham and Isaac, whether about Joseph that we did a few weeks ago, they, they point towards me. These Psalms, right, that I said from the cross, these other stories, they all, they point towards me, right? All of the Old Testament points towards him, his work on the cross, and, and the bringing of the good news of the gospel to the entire world. And so we can, looking back, we can and should read the Old Testament looking for and expecting to see Jesus all throughout its pages, right? And by the time the gospel writers are are writing their accounts uh, many years afterwards, they finally do understand this and they're including these words for us. And it isn't just that God knew that Jesus was going to be, you know, crucified ahead of time, kind of using foreknowledge, right? But in his sovereignty, God designed it that way. And we see this afterwards when Peter is preaching in the book of Acts, the first sermon at Pentecost. Uh, Peter says in Acts 2, Jesus was handed over to you. He's speaking to this Jewish audience. Jesus was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, right? It was always the plan. And I think what's most humbling is is part of what we see in the verses that surround uh, that statement. Peter says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. God had made it clear to the people in that day, Jesus is the Messiah. But those that rejected him, they were responsible for that. They were responsible for his death. And it's kind of a sobering thought because it's a thought for us uh, that's true for us as well, that even though the cross was planned by God before the creation of the world, we're still responsible for what we do with the revelation of Christ, whether we reject it or whether we believe in him. Jesus' words from the Psalms remind us that God planned the cross, but we are responsible for what we do with it. The cross is where God's sovereign plan on one hand converges with our responsibility for our sin. And we don't know exactly how it happens, but somehow uh, God's holiness and his justice and his wrath against sin, uh, they somehow uh, work in perfect alignment with his patience and his great love for us. Those things that we sang about tonight in the songs. And as Jesus quotes from Psalm 31, into your hand I commit my spirit, he doesn't quote, or at least the gospel authors don't give us, the second half of the verse, which is, you have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Jesus didn't need redemption, right? He didn't need deliverance. He could have come down from the cross at any point, right? He willingly submitted to it. He chose to endure the cross because we needed redemption. And so that's what David's words are, his words of need. They are our words of need as we cry out to God. Listen to some of the other words from Psalm 31. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and my body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish, my years with groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction and my bones grow weak. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. Let me not be put to shame, O Lord, for I have cried out to you, 
but let the wicked be put to shame and lie silent in the grave. How great is your goodness, which you stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of men on those who take refuge in you. Love the Lord, all his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but the proud he pays back in full. And all three of the Psalms that Jesus quotes just have themes like that, uh, of the wickedness of people, of the frailty and helplessness of people, of God's deliverance, um, of those who, who follow him, but God's punishment uh, on those who bear responsibility for re- rejecting him. It's all there in those three Psalms. And we see that tension in Peter's sermon in Acts 2 that we read from a minute ago, because he, he told the people there, you bear responsibility for uh, crucifying Jesus, whom God sent. Even though it was God's plan, you put him to death on the cross. But just like Psalm 22, the response is a call to be a person who fears God, who takes refuge in him, who, who loves him. This is the response we hear in Acts 2. When the people heard all this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. That's the heart of the gospel, that every one of us, right, every person, one way or another, we've sinned over and over, we've rejected God, we've gone our own way, uh, because God is holy and perfectly just. He cannot let that sin go unpunished forever. It's going to ultimately separate us from him permanently, so he's not going to let that go for all of eternity. But because of his patience, he has waited and in a way uh, has, has created a way for justice to be served, Because of his infinite love. He's created a way for his holy wrath against sin to be satisfied um, and just has has temporarily held that back. And he's created a way for us to become righteous and be able to permanently be in his presence, right? He planned the cross. Jesus received the punishment we deserve for sin. He satisfied God's righteous anger, but he gives us his righteousness when we put our trust in him and he makes a way for us to be with him forever in eternity. And if you've never put your faith in Jesus and you're here tonight, I just encourage you to do that tonight. All it takes is just as Peter said, repent, turn away from the sin, uh, the path of sin you've chosen and turn towards God, accepting his forgiveness for your sins. Begin a life of walking with him as your savior, following him as your Lord. And if you do, um, you know, you can do that, something you can do in the quietness of your heart, something you can do with someone after the service. Um, but I encourage you in that. God planned the cross, but we're responsible for what we do with it. And I think our response should definitely be um, a, a sobering kind of humble view of our sin, but obviously also awe and praise and thankfulness for what he did. Um, and just peace that a sovereign God who loves us is fully in control. Um, third, Jesus' words from the Psalms should bring us comfort knowing that there's hope in our worst moments. Because because of his life and death, right, the one who is 100% God also became 100% human. He can identify with our our lowest points, our absolute worst moments in life. In his life, he he dealt with temptation. He suffered grief. He suffered loss of a loved one. And in those final days and hours and moments, he, he experienced incredible suffering and pain and rejection, even guilt and shame. Uh, Hebrews 4, which uh, Pastor Paul read from last week, um, for uh, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. When Jesus quotes from those psalms, he he shows us he's experiencing some of the worst of what the sinful world has to offer. But he also shows us there's hope, right? Because he has overcome it for us. And he brings us mercy and grace in our greatest time of need. And when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's not saying that because God has actually abandoned him, right? Just as David was not truly saying that God had abandoned him. And we can know that God has not abandoned us, right, in our sin, in our desperate situation, even though we don't deserve the grace. 
But the cross was planned, right, by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together from the beginning. And the rest of Psalm 22 is clear that God does deliver and rescue his people. And nobody knows that better than Jesus on the cross. But as he says those words, we know too he is experiencing that, that deep suffering and pain that David felt and that others throughout time have felt. We can't even really imagine, you know, some of the physical suffering, of course, that Jesus suffered on the cross, but even more so the taking on of the guilt and the, and the, sh- the sin and the shame of just all generations of people. I think about my own sin and guilt and shame in just a, a, a thing that seems like a small sin and imagine uh, the near infinite amount he took on. So whatever you've, you've been through or going through, whether it's illness or grief or loss or pain, stress, rejection, temptation, like... He completely understands it. Even even guilt and shame from your sin. He took it on him at the cross even though it wasn't his. We we can't say God doesn't get it. <laughs> right? We can't say it because he became fully human and endured some of, of the worst that the world has to offer. And if you're in one of those low times of life right now, um, Jesus gave us two very clear examples of what to do, and we saw it here, but prayer and scripture, right? Whether it was at the temptation or whether it was on the cross. Uh, he spoke with his father and he quoted scripture. What a, what a model for us. We can take comfort in knowing that Jesus uh, understands and can identify with us. And lastly, Jesus' words from the Psalms are a guarantee that there is no wrath to come for those who do put their trust in him. There's no fearful expectation of judgment for those that are eagerly awaiting his return. Redemption, at least kind of part one of it, is complete. It is finished. Uh, Hebrews 9.26, and actually this is, I think, what Pastor Paul quoted last week from here. Uh, from Hebrews says Jesus has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself it is done the sacrifice the bearing of sin right the satisfaction of God's wrath and justice all because of God's love and patience but Good Friday is just part one of the redemption plan and we see that in the next part of Hebrews 9 Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people and he'll appear a second time not to bear sin but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. We can know we're saved now because of Christ's work on the cross, but we wait for the full effects of that salvation until he returns. And it's, it's a little bit like someone who is, is drowning, their, their boat wrecked and they're in the water, right? Uh, and, and maybe they've had a chance to call for help. Maybe they even got somebody on the radio uh, and that person said, we're coming for you. And they see the boat in the distance. They, they see maybe the rescue helicopter coming. And they know they're saved, but they got to hang on just a little while longer because it's not fully completed until they're pulled out of the water and into the boat. And and that's the the message of Good Friday, right? It's it's done. It's finished. It's not not what we need to do, but it's what Jesus has done for us. And as the author of Hebrews says, right, put your faith in him and eagerly await his return when he completes it. In his final minutes on the cross, Jesus gave us four statements to give us hope that this was the plan it was always the plan to come as fully God and fully man to truly identify with us and in his love to cover over our sins even though we didn't deserve it and provide a way back to the Father and tonight on Good Friday um, as we remember this uh, we're going to spend a few minutes observing communion and singing one final song and communion is a place where as a body Um, We come together to remember what Christ did for us at the cross. Even what we read about in Matthew and the Psalms, the beating, the flogging, the the piercing, the, the breakdown of the body. When we take communion, the bread symbolizes his body broken for us and the cup, uh, his blood spilled for us. Uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
And as we celebrate tonight, um, we're going to do it a little bit differently, uh, but Mark is going to um, begin to dismiss you by row, and your row will come up, and you are going to uh, receive the bread on that side, and you'll walk through, and you'll receive the cup on the other side, and then you can return to your seats. Um, and as uh, we begin to get some music up front, um, you have a, a little time of reflection, and then you can take the elements uh, on your own when you're ready. Um, you can spend a few minutes uh, confessing and just getting yourself right with God before you take it. Um, communion is, is something that's done by the body of Christ. So if you're here tonight and, and you're, you're still on your spiritual journey, you don't really know Jesus, you haven't really put your faith in him, it's appropriate to, um, to either pass by at the table or just to, to stay seated as others go. Um, but we'll begin to dismiss for communion and then you can take it at, uh, at your own timing.